In this episode, I'm going to show you an extremely powerful technique for how to derive deep existential truths about reality for yourself, and also psychological truths as well, not just existential ones. And this is contemplation by using a journal. It's a simple technique, and I'll share it with you in a minute, but let me just underscore the importance in this work of seeking the truth for yourself, not through books, not through videos, not through belief systems or ideologies, and not even through my own teachings, but for yourself. And this is something that I've been saying really uh, for years now, from the very beginning. Honestly, I'm tired of saying it at this point. And that is what I've been saying is that you have to seek the truth in your direct experience and not just take my word for it, and not to believe me. Beliefs and ideology is the biggest trap in all of this self-actualization business. And really, if I was doing the greatest service to you, I would begin and end every single episode with a disclaimer. All of my videos, all 300 or so videos that I have, each one of them would have a disclaimer at the beginning and at the end, which would tell you that nothing that I say in these videos is actually true. All of it is just beliefs. It's all just mental masturbation in theory. It means absolutely nothing for you unless you are able to go and to discover, rediscover these truths in your own direct experience and that you are at a great risk of falling into the trap of ideology. But, you know, it's boring for me to say this over and over again. And honestly, to me, this is just obvious. It's so obvious that this is like step number zero in any inquiry into the nature of reality or life or anything. Like anything you do in life must begin with step zero in that you are falling into beliefs and ideologies which are not your own that you need to make your own by going out there and actually tracing what's true in the real world and seeing if that matches up with what you were told in some video or in some book or by some belief system. That is the essence of truth seeking. So either you will do that or you won't. If you won't, I guarantee you that you will be deluded and you will make many grave mistakes and you will limit yourself in how high you will be able to develop and how conscious you can become. And you will not find the ultimate truth. And there will be many other truths. No, I'm not just talking about the ultimate truth. There will be all other minor truths which you will also never find and be deluded about. So you will be deluded on many layers, both the ultimate layer and all the intermediate layers as well. So that's how important this is. The reason I don't say this in every single episode is, like I said, because it's honestly, it's so obvious to me. And also because it's, it's rather boring and, and monotonous to say this all the time. So let's address this problem with this technique using a journal to contemplate. Now you might wonder, Leo, but why should I contemplate when I can just get the answers from a video or from a book or from you? What's the point of actualize.org if I can't use the answers that you're giving me? It's just like with math. With math, to understand math, you must actually do math. It does not help to just watch a video about math. You will not understand math that way. Nor will it help for you just to get the answers to a math problem. You will not understand math that way. You must actually go through the pain of doing the math. And that's precisely what differentiates a deluded person from a self-actualizing person from a conscious person. The difference is that the conscious person actually goes through the work and it takes work. And the reason that most people don't do it is just because they're mentally lazy. It takes time. It takes effort to actually derive answers for yourself. 
Most people are just like most kids in school. What they do is they just copy answers from the back of, ma of the math book. They don't actually go through the problems. And of course, because of that, they're poor mathematicians. Except with mathematics, it's okay. You can be a poor mathematician and still do well in life. But you cannot be poor at tracking the truth and do well in life. You cannot. So that's why you got to start to derive this stuff for yourself. This is critical. This is absolutely critical. And this one simple technique, which I'm going to show you here today, can transform your whole life. This is really the essence of self-actualization right here. So listen close. How do you actually contemplate properly? Well, first you need some method for contemplation. Now, I have an episode in the past that I shot called Contemplation, where it, I went into depth about contemplation. Um, and there, I just sort of assumed that you would be contemplating in your mind. And that's a good way you can contemplate in your mind. But the problem is that it's very easy to lose track of what's going on there. You can get lost in monkey mind, lost in your fantasies and ideas. So what I have for you now is just a, uh, a more rigorous technique, which is you will be using some sort of note-taking device, either a pad of paper like this, some legal pad. This is just very simple. You can go to Walmart and buy a whole box of these and some pens and, and pencils. Uh, and, and that's really good. Or you can use a digital format, like if you're using OneNote, like I talked about in my Commonplace book episode, maybe you want to keep your journal there. But um, uh, there's actually uh, some important benefits to just having an analog system in this case. Because with, your, with, a, with a digital journal system, you're going to be on your phone or on your iPad or something doing this. It's not ideal because you have all those distractions, notifications and, and games and apps and all this emails and all sorts of weird stuff. Um, when you're contemplating, you just want to be all by yourself, completely focused on your thoughts. And that's why just a simple pen and paper system uh, works so great. And that's what I tend to use rather than using my commonplace book, which is what I use for most of my other forms of note taking and various other journals that I have. But I make a distinction between other journals that I keep and contemplation. And you'll, you'll understand that uh, as I keep explaining how this works. So you get your notepad and then you go and you sit down in a quiet place and you set aside a good chunk of time, 30 to 60 minutes. The reason you want a chunk of time at least that big is because you're going to have to build up momentum and your mind is going to be lazy. And that's one of the biggest obstacles you'll encounter when you start to contemplate is that your mind is lazy, it's distracted, it wants to run off and do other stuff rather than to actually contemplate. And when you first start doing it, you're going to be rusty at it. You're not going to be able to just come up with answers right on the fly. So it'll probably take you 10, 15 minutes just to get in the groove. So you got to set aside that time. And then what you do is at the top of your page, you write the question that you will be contemplating for this entire chunk of time. So to focus your contemplation here, you're not just going to be contemplating and daydreaming random questions. You're going to pick one question. What's one question that's important to you that you really want to get to the bottom of? For example, maybe you want to know what is a thought? That would be a good example. And then you're going to start to contemplate this. So I'll be giving you many examples and I'll give you, be giving you a whole list here of various questions you can contemplate. But let's just start with this example to explain how this works. So what is a thought? You write this at the top of your page and now you start to wonder and think about this. But very importantly, you have to start thinking from ground zero, which means you have to throw away all your preconceived ideas and beliefs, any cultural teachings that you acquired, anything you learned in school or in university, any books you've read, and including even all of my teachings. Whatever you've heard from me about what thoughts are, throw all of that away. The point and the essence of contemplation is to sit down all by yourself and to think about a topic or a question completely from scratch, not relying on anything from any external source. So you're going inside and you're really working through the problem in the same way that you might be working through a math problem or a logical proof. And so you start to question, what is a thought? And as you do this, 
it's very critical that you don't just speculate or philosophize about what a thought is, but that you ground yourself in your direct experience and in concrete examples. So what do I mean by this? Let's really go through this. So if I'm thinking, what is a thought? The first thing that I need to do is I need to ground myself, which means I need to actually find an example of a thought in my direct experience. Now with thoughts, fortunately, it's very easy because, hey, what is a thought is itself a thought. So as I'm thinking, what is a thought? Well, I could say to myself, oh, is what is a thought a thought? Oh yeah, it is. Okay, so that's a thought. So I already got an example to work with right there. And even to say that I have an example to work with, that's another thought. So now I got two thoughts to work with. And in fact, I can come up with thoughts right on the fly. I can think of a, a red apple or a tall tree and all those are thoughts. And that's good. And see, what you're doing there is you're actually grounding yourself. You're not speculating. You're not coming up with some theory of what a thought is. So a mistake in contemplation would be to start to like bring scientific theory into this and to say, well, I know from stuff that I learned in college about neuroscience that what a thought really is, is a thought is just some, is, it's just neurons in the brain and there, there's chemicals. And I read all this stuff about myelination in the nerve cells and different neurotransmitters like uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine and serotonin and dopamine and all this. And this creates a thought and the neurons are linked in some way and then something happens, blah, 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 blah. That is not contemplation. That's you regurgitating stuff that you've learned. So we're really pushing ourselves to think from scratch as though you are the first person ever in the history of mankind who has ever thought about what a thought is. And if you put yourself in that position, then you realize you can't rely on anybody else. You can't rely on a textbook or some religious teaching or some scientific thing you, you saw on some documentary or in some video. So, all you really got to work with is direct experience. You have a thought. Think of a red apple. Okay, that's a thought right there. So what is that? And then you question and you sit and you kind of stew in it and you let your mind observe what a thought is. Be careful not to go too quickly or to jump to conclusions. The key with proper contemplation is that you are raising a question you're bringing an example to mind right now in your direct experience. You're training your awareness upon that object, like the thought of a red apple. And then you're just observing. You want to observe the mechanism of what that is. Notice how a thought is arising in your mind. To do that, you don't think about thoughts. You observe thoughts. That's a very important distinction. If you start to think about thoughts, you're, you're off into speculation territory. Whereas if you're observing thoughts, that's where you're actually learning what a thought is. And this right here is really the essence of science. Maybe you were taught and maybe you think that science is some sort of grand theory building exercise, or it's an exercise in doing laboratory work, or maybe you thought it's like, uh, posing a hypothesis and then proposing an experiment and testing that, validating it, falsifying it. None of that is really the essence of science. The essence of science is what we're doing here in contemplation. You are taking an actual object in the real world as it is occurring without any opinions or ideas about it. And you're just observing what it is, how it arises and what it's doing. And the difficulty with that is that you have to be able to set aside all of your own stuff and baggage and your emotions and your projections and all that to observe an object just precisely as it is. And it can require a lot of observation of a very simple object to finally get to the bottom of what it really is. So I might think of a red apple and then I might just sit there for a minute and just kind of keep bringing that red apple back into my mind because I bring it up, then it disappears. I bring it up, it disappears. So I just maybe keep doing that for a minute. 
And I just wonder, what, hmm, what is this red apple? And then maybe I bring to mind some other example, like a yellow lemon. And I bring that a couple of times into mind. It's like, okay, so that's another type of thought. So we've got two thoughts. We've got a red apple and a yellow apple or a yellow lemon. Okay. So are these, are these different thoughts or uh, is there only one kind of thought? How many kinds of thoughts are there? And so then that leads to the next question. So I think now I think about that. And so I now start to bring to mind all the different kinds of thoughts that there are. There are thoughts about physical objects. There are thoughts about intangible things like love. And there are thoughts about all sorts of things, right? So I start to think about that. And then I start to wonder, if I bring to mind a red apple right now, then I bring to mind a yellow lemon. Then I bring to mind a red apple again. So that's two red apples. So was the first thought of a red apple, was that different? Was that a different thought than my second thought of a red apple? Or are they the exact same thing? What's the difference? And then I don't speculate about that. Again, I sit and I actually observe in my direct experience. What's the difference? So maybe I'll bring up a red apple a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time. And I'll wonder, are they really different or are they the same thing? And what really differentiates thoughts from physical objects? Is a physical object also a thought? There's an idea. That's interesting. Or is there really a boundary there? So what is the boundary? What's the difference between an object and a thought? Can we say that an object is or that a thought is a kind of object? That's interesting. And see, you can take it into a million different directions. You could ask all sorts of ancillary questions like, where do thoughts come from? And you don't speculate about where thoughts come from. Because look, a thought is something you have. Therefore, you don't need to speculate about where it comes from. It's happening in your direct experience right now. You're thinking thoughts every second of your life. So where do thoughts come from? You don't ask me. You don't go look in a book or watch a video you check your direct experience. And if you can't get it in your direct experience, no book, no video, no teaching is gonna cure that because you've got the most pure form of it already happening inside your mind. You have direct access to your own thoughts. So if you can't figure it out that way, you ain't ever gonna figure it out. And no amount of teachings will, will fix that for you. You see this? You see why contemplation is so important? Then you start to question any assumptions you have about thoughts. Like maybe you have an assumption that thoughts occur inside the brain. And then you have to ask yourself, is that true? Do I actually find in my direct experience that thoughts are occurring inside the brain? Or is that an idea that I just acquired from my culture or from my schooling? Maybe you have some other assumption like that thoughts are something that only human beings have. You got to question that. Is that true? How do I know that only human beings have thoughts? And you wonder about that. You always keep grounding yourself in direct experience. You keep bringing up examples, concrete ones and you actually observe the mechanics of what's really going on. Try not to anticipate the answer, but instead rather open your mind and start off by admitting that you don't know what the answer to the question is. You don't actually know what a thought is. You don't actually know what an object is. You don't know what good and evil are. You don't know what reality is. You don't know what God is. There's so many things you don't know. But of course, this is one of the, one of the trickiest parts of contemplation is to get your mind to understand, first and foremost, that you don't know. That is like step zero of contemplating. Because if you think you already know, then there's not going to be any genuine curiosity within you to contemplate a thing. Because, hey, you already think you know it. So what's the point of contemplating it? Leo, I already know what a thought is. Why would I waste my time? Why would I waste an hour of my day contemplating what a thought is? Right, because you think you know, but actually you don't. What you'll be amazed to discover is that 
you haven't actually thought about any of these things almost ever in your life until you sit down with a pad of paper and a pencil and start to actually contemplate. So let's go through a few other examples, just so you really, I want you to really get a sense for what I'm doing here when I'm contemplating. So let's contemplate the question, what is an object? What is an object? So first I'll write that down on my pad of paper. And then I'll try to get myself to admit that I don't really know what an object is. I mean, sure, I can bring up examples of objects, apples and trees and cars and people and blah, blah, blah. But what is an object really? That starts to open up some room for me to wonder. And then I'll start to ask other ancillary questions about what objects might be, and I'll bring to mind a concrete object for us to work with. So maybe I have a pencil in my hand, the pencil that I'm using to, to take these notes. So I'll look at this, I'll, I'll look at this pencil and I say, wait, a, so is this pencil an object? Yes, this pencil is an object. Okay, what else is an object? So I'll look around the room. Well, there's a couch, there's a table, there's a glass of water, there's a, a lamp, there's there's a cat, there's something else, there's a human being sitting there, whatever. Okay, so those are all objects. So what is the common denominator between all those? And I'm not going to speculate, I'm going to actually, I'm going to give myself a minute to really wonder about, that's a profound question. What is the common denominator between all these things that we call objects? Is it their separateness? Like the lamp is separate from the coffee table, but what is separateness? Let me wonder about separate separation. I mean, who determines what is separate from something else? Like for example, on my coffee table, I might have a bottle of vitamins. Now, is this bottle of vitamins, is it one object or is it a hundred objects? Because the vitamin bottle has a bunch of pills inside. Let's say it has a hundred vitamins inside. So what is that? Who is determining whether we count this as a single object, everything that the, that's encompassed by the bottle, or as a hundred different objects, all the little individual pills inside? So then you will wonder, so are objects a subjective notion or an objective notion? Mm, that's very interesting. Could it be that my human mind is actually projecting the notion of objects out onto the external world? and that they don't really exist? Where does one object begin and another one end? So for example, you might say, well, the coffee table is clearly separated from the lamp, and that's how we distinguish those two different objects. But there's air connecting the table and the lamp. So is the air then a third object? And speaking of which, air, air is an interesting example because how many objects of air are there? One, are you going to say there's only one object of air in the entire world, meaning the entire atmosphere? So that means that the air in this room is the same object as the air in the next room, as the air outside as the air in Australia, in China, in Antarctica, in Europe, and everywhere else? Is that what you're saying? And then where does that object end? Because we know the air goes up high into the atmosphere many miles, but then at some point it ends, but where precisely does it end? And so what distinguishes the air object from, let's say, the vacuum of empty space? And is the vacuum of empty space, is that an object? Or is that something else? And if it's something else, that means what? We have now two types of things in the world. We have objects and then we have other stuff. What could be other than objects? And then you might wonder, what about a thought? Is a thought an object? Are there tangible objects and then intangible objects? How do you distinguish those two? And again, you don't speculate. You actually bring to mind examples. So bring to mind an example of a tangible object. That's easy. Let's say a lamp or a table, 
And then an intangible object like, let's say, the number one or the thought of a red apple. That would be an intangible object. Or maybe air, or maybe a vacuum, something like that. Or maybe the mind. What is the mind? Is the mind an object? Is consciousness an object? See, so you sit there and you think about all this. You can, you can see that you begin with this one question, simple question of what is an object, and then it starts to flower into clusters of other questions, ancillary related questions. And you start to wonder about all those. And what, that's generally what you find with contemplation is that one question leads to 10 more. And each one of those leads to 10 more. And so it starts to expand very quickly. And uh, you can kind of get lost in the weeds. But remember to kind of keep your mind on the ball, which is the original question. So don't stray too far. Keep coming back to what is an object. But also keep bringing up these different examples and, and these other questions just to kind of help you to understand what an object is. And now you might sit there and do this for 60 minutes, but you might not feel like you've resolved this question. That's okay. Don't expect to resolve it in 60 minutes. It could take you a year to really get to the bottom of what an object is. The key here is not to get to the bottom answer as if there is some sort of simple answer that you can write as a sentence. Like, an object is blank, and you can just fill in that blank with something, and then you got the right answer, and it's like you passed some sort of test. That's not what contemplation is about. The real value of this work is in having your mind go through and explore the nooks and crannies of all these different questions and all the different possible answers. And even if you don't come up with some ultimate answer to this question, that doesn't matter because you've still extracted the value. You've still grown. Your mind will have matured because just you simply spent an hour or two exploring this question. Let's consider another example. What is evil? So I will write that down at the top of my page and then I will think about it. I'm going to make sure that I don't fall into the trap of just going into mental verbal diarrhea, where I just start to write a bunch of stuff on my page. Write paragraph after paragraph mindlessly. That's not contemplation. Contemplation is you sit for a minute or two and just think about the question. You bring a few examples to mind. You bring a few more ancillary questions to mind. And only after you've pondered a little bit, then you can write down some answer. Then you can think about that. Maybe write down a little bit more. But see, it, it goes slowly. You're not just filling up page after page after page with, with mental verbal diarrhea. You need to what, gain what I call traction. Your mind has to actually track reality. So the way we do that with this question is, with what is evil, we would say, okay, so what is evil? Well, the Bible says evil is this thing. And society and my culture says that evil is something else. And science maybe, say, maybe says that evil doesn't even, even exist. So who's correct? Well, all of that is just external sources. Forget all that. Let me focus on what's actually in my direct experience. Is there evil happening in my direct experience right now? Maybe, probably not, if you're just sitting contemplating. Okay, so what's the next best thing? If evil is not happening right now, can I bring some evil to mind? What is some evil that happened to me in my life where I thought something was really evil? So let me go back into my mind and actually go through my past, find a specific example where maybe somebody broke into my car and stole my things. And that to me seemed like evil. Or maybe there was some politician that I saw on TV who uh, was charged with corruption and bribery and I consider that to be evil, okay. So let's go with that example, this bribery case. That was clear evil. Who says so? Am I saying that bribery is evil? Or is my society saying that bribery is evil? Is evil found as an objective law of the universe? Or is evil something that human beings have created and are projecting? In other words, is evil subjective or is it objective? 
If it's objective, how so? Where is that law actually written in the universe? Is there like some deity up in the clouds that is holding this law in place? Or is it like a physical law? The way you might imagine the law of gravity or something, or some Newtonian law, some Einsteinian law. Uh, what is it? Or is evil something that we just come to as a social consensus? So you think about all these things and maybe you write down some answers, but then you ask yourself, that answer that I just wrote down, is that actually true? How do I know that's true? Could this just be a cultural thing that I picked up as I was growing up? Could it be that in some cultures, bribery is actually not considered evil? Mm, then you start to think about that. And you start to think about the, the role that culture plays. Then you might say, are there any examples I can think of that are evil cross-culturally in every single culture? Maybe you'd say, murder is, is that. But then you might wonder, what is murder? After all, murder happens every single day in every single country all around the world. And in many cases, this murder uh, isn't considered evil. There are many examples of murder which isn't considered evil. Murder in the name of self-defense, murder in the name of fighting some war to defend your country, uh, a preemptive attack, or um, even things like euthanasia, doctor-assisted suicides, or for example, um, putting a dog or a cat to sleep who's sick, take them to the vet, put them to sleep, uh, that's not considered evil by many, by many cultures and many people. So what are these distinctions? Who is making these distinctions? Then you think about all that. And you think about, are there degrees of evil or is evil just a binary thing? And if there are degrees, who determines what these degrees are? And is evil for a human being the same thing as evil for a lion or for a dog or for an ant or for an alien in, in outer space? Why does the concept or notion of evil exist at all? What is that about? Could the notion of evil be serving some sort of hidden purpose or agenda? Could I or my mind be using the notion of evil for some purpose? What is the purpose of evil? What would happen if I removed the notion of evil from my mind. And so all of these things you just kind of keep pondering and thinking about, and you keep jotting down various answers to it. And don't be afraid to write down a wrong answer. This is a very kind of uh, rough, imperfect process, this contemplation. Oftentimes when I'm contemplating, I'll write down an answer, then just even as I'm writing it, I'll immediately realize, oh, this is nonsense. But still, it can be useful to write it out. Write out the nonsense because it's very useful to write out the nonsense and then to look upon it and to realize, no, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't make sense. This is contradictory or it's just silly or I can come up with examples that um, invalidate what I just wrote. And that's good. That's exactly what you want. That's how you're learning is by writing down answers and then realizing that, no, these are way too simplistic and they don't actually match up with what I'm experiencing in my direct uh, experience. Let's consider a third example. What is personal development? And by this question, I don't mean personal development as a field, like the self-help field. I mean, what does it mean to actually develop oneself as a human being? What does it mean to grow? What is the difference between an undeveloped person and a developed person. Now, can you see the power of knowing the answer to that question or of just exploring that question? After all, if what you're trying to do in life and the reason you're watching all these videos of mine is because you want to develop yourself personally, yet you have no idea what personal development actually is other than maybe stuff that I've told you, then what are you really doing? You're pursuing something, you have no idea what you're pursuing. So of course you're gonna be very inefficient at pursuing it. So you write down this question at the top of your page and you start to think about it. 
And here, you have to be very rigorous not to speculate because you've got a lot of ideas about stuff that I've said about personal development, but you need to actually bring to mind in your own life examples of personal development and work with those rather than things that I've said. So you might maybe bring to mind an example of an undeveloped person in your mind, maybe a friend of yours from from high school or something that you think was a very undeveloped person. And then you bring to mind some other person who you think is a very developed person. And now maybe you compare both of them and you say, what's the difference between these two? And then you actually, you look, you see, well, the undeveloped person acts like a jerk and maybe they're very ideological, they're closed-minded, they're not very con- they're not self-reflective, they don't introspect, yada yada yada. What about the developed person? What are some of the qualities that make him seem developed? Well, he's not emotionally reactive. He's more open to new ideas, willing to admit that he makes mistakes. Uh, is able to say that he's sorry, blah, 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 whatever, right? And so you compare this and then you see, okay, so what's the, co- what's the common thread? What is the essence of personal development? Like if I wanted to increase my own degree of personal development by 10%, what would have to happen? What would that look like? And then you write down your answers. And you keep exploring this question, keep asking these ancillary questions like, are there degrees of development? How many degrees of development are there? Is there just one component to personal development or are there multiple components? Does personal development mean like becoming a more loving human being? Is that it? Is that, is that all that personal development boils down to is just becoming more loving? Or does it also boil down to other components like uh, education? reading books. Can you develop yourself without reading a single book? Can you be personally developed but not loving? And you think about that and you bring examples to mind. And so you try to kind of like play in your mind with all these different scenarios and you try to get to the essence of what this thing called personal development is. So that's how you contemplate it. This process of actually sitting down and doing this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where you get your results. This is where you get your understanding. You do not get understanding from merely listening to me. You do, but it's a minuscule amount compared to how much you will get when you start to go through this contemplation process, especially using a journal. You'll feel it. You'll feel when your mind gets what I call traction with these issues. And it will feel amazing because in 30 minutes, by sitting there with this notepad and thinking about one of these questions, in 30 minutes, you will get more traction and more understanding and clarity than you did in perhaps five years or 10 years of your life on this question. And that's simply because you've never actually bothered to systematically, rigorously think through the question. Maybe you've had it in the back of your mind, but you never actually sat down and thought it through. Here are some starting assumptions for contemplation. Assumption number one, you are full of shit. Assumption number two, nothing your mind says can be trusted. Assumption number three, all beliefs and teachings are false. Assumption number four, only direct experience is true. And assumption number five, the truth is not fragile. Which means that you're not going to hurt the truth by questioning. You're only going to clarify the truth with rigorous questioning. So you don't need to be afraid about... uh, doing something wrong in this contemplation process. You can do no wrong. All you can do by asking questions is just 
get more clarity. And anything that's false will get purified in the light of awareness and questioning. Now, you might say, Leo, but uh, how do I know that all these assumptions that you said, these five assumptions, that they're actually true? And their answer is, of course, you don't. I gave them to you as assumptions. An assumption is something that you use to start your inquiry, because you got to start somewhere, and your starting place is always imperfect. So you can start with these assumptions, but then that doesn't mean you take them on faith. That means you can question them too. In fact, you could sit down for an hour and write this question at the top of your page. Am I full of shit? And spend an hour thinking about that. Is it true that you're full of shit? What are all the ways in which you are full of shit? Is that a good assumption to ground your self-inquiry in, or in this case, you're contemplating in? Um, and uh, that's how you test if what I'm telling you is correct, if these assumptions are correct. Now, maybe you discover after a few hours of thinking about this that actually, no, I'm not full of shit. And that will be a discovery for you. But to go through that process is important. If you just say, no, Leo, I'm not full of shit, you're full of shit. If you say that, then you haven't, see, you're just defending yourself. You're just playing ideological games. You haven't actually gone through the process. You haven't done any work, you see. So what I'm really trying to get you to do here is I'm actually trying to get you to do some work. But of course, you're lazy and you don't want to do any work. So that's the whole game that we're playing here all the time with Actualize.org. I keep trying to get you to do work and you keep trying to come up with reasons and excuses for why you shouldn't do work or why you don't need to do the work because you already know everything and because nothing really can be changed in your life. See how the game is played? Let's clarify what contemplation is not. Contemplation is not speculation and guesswork. Contemplation is not justifying your existing beliefs, which is very tempting to do. Contemplation is not building new beliefs. These answers that you're deriving from all this questioning, it would be a mistake to say, oh, okay, Leo, I did an hour of contemplating. I got my answer, and now I'm going to believe that answer as though it's the truth. That would be a mistake. That's not the point. The point is actually to go through the process and to see how complicated and nuanced all these questions are. And while you might get some clarification, that clarification is good, but clarification is different from belief. Make sure you're not using contemplation to build new beliefs or to build some grand narratives and theories. That's another mistake. That's not contemplation, building theories. That's something else. That's a constructive process. Contemplation is more of a destructive process. You're breaking stuff down. Contemplation is not daydreaming, fantasy, or imagining stuff. Contemplation is not proof or coming up with arguments or debates against critics. Maybe there's someone you disagree with philosophically, politically, ideologically, economically. Maybe there's somebody you disagree with about enlightenment or about spirituality. Maybe you disagree with me. And so you think that you can sit there and you can write some kind of argument against me to rebut me, to debunk me. That is not contemplation. Contemplation is not opinionizing or justifying existing opinions. And contemplation is not the pursuit of success or practical advantage. So, especially if you're a stage orange type of person, then you're really into pragmatism and you're really into personal achievement and success. And so you might say, ah, oh, Leo, yeah, I like the idea of contemplation. How can I use contemplation to become more successful, to improve my business and to um, have more sex and to be better at speaking and to do this? That's not contemplation. Contemplation is about pure understanding of what a thing is. You're interested in just what it is, not what it can do for you, not how you can become enriched by it, but just by what it is. You have a trust that 
in having a deep understanding of what things are at a fundamental existential level, that this will resolve many of your existing problems in life. Your problems in life don't come from lack of chasing after success for the most part. For some of you it does, but for, uh, for the most part it comes from a lack of deep understanding of what things are. And in fact, if you're going to use contemplation to try to pursue success, you're actually going to do the opposite of seeking the truth and understanding. You're going to be trying to use contemplation to somehow find better ways to manipulate reality. And that is actually one of the major sources of all of your problems in life, is that you're such a manipulator and you're always looking for practical advantages. But happiness doesn't come from practical advantage. It also doesn't come from success. And if you doubt me about that, then contemplate what is happiness. So let's reiterate what contemplation is. Contemplation is observation, seeing how a thing works. It's deconstruction, breaking down ideas and beliefs. It is awareness and what I call going meta. That means that as you're contemplating, you're also observing the process of contemplation itself. And as you're observing the process of contemplation itself, you're also observing that. So you're sort of observing yourself, observing yourself, observing yourself. You're observing yourself thinking. You're observing yourself deconstructing things. Contemplation is self-reflection. You are always kind of like looking at your role. What is your role in understanding these questions? So it's not like you're just asking these questions in a sort of objective manner as though you're floating above the whole universe looking down upon these questions. No, you're intimately involved with these questions. If you're asking a question like, what is happiness? That, that, that's a uh, very intimate question. You see, you're not above and beyond that. Because if you're very honest, you will notice that you care about your own happiness very much. Very much, you're completely attached to your own happiness. But that takes self-reflection to see that. Contemplation is questioning assumptions. Contemplation is questioning beliefs, teachings, and culture. Contemplation is thinking completely independently for yourself. And it's the desire to know the truth at any cost. And that's very important. You're going after the truth even if you're afraid of what the consequences will be. And when you really go deeply after the truth, there will be some scary consequences because all of us spend a lot of our time being in denial, suppressing and repressing all sorts of truths that we don't like about ourselves. Ugly things, things that we lie to ourselves about, things that we don't want to admit to ourselves, things we've done wrong, ways we've been selfish, ways we've been jerks. And, and so that's ugly stuff that you're not going to want to discover about yourself. But in this process, if you're really pursuing truth, all that will come out. And so if all you care about is pursuing the truth only when it's pleasant, then as soon as you get to the really deep truths, the truths that can actually transform you, you see you're going to stop because those aren't going to be pleasant truths. So keep that in mind. Okay, so let me give you a list of things to contemplate. Uh, I, I gave you an even larger list in my other contemplation episodes. You can go check that out. Here, I want to give you just some very practical questions that you can get started on right now. Maybe this entire month, you can start contemplating these. What is meaning? What is science? What is evil? What is ego? What is a concept? What is a belief? What is truth? What is evidence? What is a symbol? What is language? What is fear? What is happiness? What is identity? What is thought? What is conflict? What is duality? What is a boundary? What is reason? What is culture? What is judgment? What is an object? What is value? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's hundreds of questions like this that you can keep asking yourself. You could spend the next 20 years of your life every single day doing this one practice. And if you do, you will completely transform your whole life. 
I deliberately left out the really hard questions. Questions like, what am I? What is reality? What is God? Because I want you to avoid these for now. I want you to just build a habit of just doing ordinary level contemplation. Not self-inquiry. Self-inquiry for me is, is separate from contemplation. Now, you have to understand that this word contemplation, different teachers and different traditions use this word in different ways. What I mean by contemplation is that you're sitting down and yes, you are thinking, you are using your mind. And I don't just reserve this for the purposes of attaining enlightenment. Some traditions will talk about contemplation for the purposes of enlightenment, in which case really they're talking about something like self-inquiry. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. I advocate that in other areas. That's a very powerful method. Um, but really, you got to build up to that. Most people are not ready to do that kind of level of contemplation. That's like the deepest levels of contemplation. Those questions like, what am I? What is reality? What is God? I deliberately want you to avoid these for now because to really answer these questions, you have to actually have uh, a profound mystical experience, an expansion of consciousness. You're not going to answer these questions just by coming up with verbal answers. Uh, and it can take you years to really get to the bottom of these. So we don't want you to get stuck. We want you to start with easy ones. And as you get good at just ordinary contemplating, then you can go and maybe tackle some of these really deep ones. I want you to also understand that there's a lot of different stuff that you can contemplate. There's not just one purpose to contemplation like enlightenment. That might be like the ultimate purpose per se. But even if you become enlightened, that doesn't mean that you've answered all the smaller questions. That doesn't mean you understand what an object is or what culture is or what science is or what, uh, let's say, reason is or what language is. See, those need to be deliberately contemplated in and of themselves, independent of whether you're pursuing enlightenment or not. And there's value to understanding what those things are, which is why there's more to this work than just the pursuit of enlightenment. Now, you might wonder, Leo, how is contemplation different from self-inquiry? When you're doing really profound self-inquiry, you're going to need to transcend your mind. You're going to need to transcend thinking. And, of course, transcend writing, even. Whereas with the contemplation that I'm talking about, I'm talking about a more general notion of contemplation. For me, contemplation just means thinking about how life works or some facet of life. And that does involve the mind. Now, maybe if you really contemplate some facet of reality very deeply, you could transcend the mind. You can kind of go into this very hyper-intuitive mode and maybe even beyond that into some kind of mystical experience about it. But, but generally, what I'm saying here is, is something much more simple and basic. You can get enormous benefit to your development just by doing ordinary contemplation, using ordinary thinking, using the mind. And, you know... Uh, some spiritual teachers will say, oh, the mind is evil, the mind is bad, you got to transcend the mind. That's true when you're going like balls to the wall for enlightenment. That's true. You do got to transcend the mind. And the mind will be a big obstacle. But before you get there, you got a lot of work to do. So, I mean, if, if you're at the point where you are ready to transcend the mind, by all means, don't let me stop you. Transcend the mind. But probably you're not at that point. And there's probably a lot of growth you can get from just starting to use your mind properly. People make this mistake of thinking that, oh, transcending the mind means that I don't think about anything. No, that just makes you stupid. Transcending the mind means that uh, you, you learn how to use the mind, you know how to use the mind, but then you can also go beyond the mind on command, so to speak. You can then have some sort of trans rational experience, mystical experience, then you can come back, you can still use the mind to figure stuff out in your life and to think about existential facets of reality that maybe you didn't access with this mystical experience. 
You can think about that. You can think about what sciences, what languages. You can think about what did that experience mean for my life and for politics and for the way society should be structured and for all this sort of stuff, right? That requires the use of the mind. So, um, so yeah, first learn to use the mind properly before you, you go transcending the entire thing. Here's some additional questions that you can ask. These are more personal. I would call these more psychological questions. Whereas the other questions I gave you were more existential. So a question like, how am I full of shit? How am I lying to myself? What truths am I refusing to accept? How am I evil? How am I corrupt? What do I fear? What do I whine about? How do I play victim? How am I self-biased? What are my conflicts of interest? How do I cling to my culture? What beliefs do I hold sacred? How am I a hypocrite? How am I arrogant? How am I being a weak human being? And so on and so forth. You can come up with all sorts of psychological questions to ask yourself. Here's what successful contemplation requires. Open-mindedness, radical open-mindedness, fearlessness, brutal self-honesty, careful observation, impartiality, the ability to step outside of your agenda. That's what I mean by impartiality. Holding no ideas sacred. You should be really willing to question any idea especially all of your pet ideas, all of your pet philosophies and your pet scientific theories and your pet ideologies and your pet uh, economic beliefs, political beliefs, social beliefs, beliefs about men and women and gender and all of this stuff. Successful contemplation requires not knowing. Really getting into a place where you start to become conscious that you don't know the answer to these questions. It requires radical self-reliance. You are here all alone. There's nobody to help you. Nobody's going to give you the answers. You are relying completely on yourself, your own mental faculties to deliver the answers to you. You're severing that umbilical cord from me, from books, from teachers, from YouTube, and from culture. And that can be a scary thing. And lastly, successful contemplation requires genuine curiosity. You have to be curious about the question. Are you curious? Why aren't you curious? These are profound questions. What is a thought? I mean, you're having thousands of thoughts every day and you've had them for decades in your life and you, don't, you still don't know what a thought is. You still don't know what an object is, despite the fact that you're surrounded by objects all the time. You go purchasing objects all the time. You go chasing objects all the time, and you don't know what they are. And you're not curious about that. You got to find an intrinsic curiosity. Get in touch with that. Don't just contemplate some question because I told you that it's important to contemplate it. That's not going to work. You have to want to answer the question. You have to want to know what you are. You have to want to know what science is. That curiosity is the driver of this entire process. Even when you just go to, to pick up your, uh, your notepad in the morning to do this process, you already have to be curious. You have to be excited about the fact that, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discover, potentially I can discover something new today. Here are some traps that are common to contemplation. Trap number one is taking things as self-evident. Leo, it's self-evident that reason works or that science is true. That's just self-evident. It's self-evident that logic is correct. It's self-evident that one plus one equals two. No, it's not. Nothing is self-evident. The only reason something seems self-evident to you is because you blindly believe it. That's it. That's the only reason. Or maybe you've done an enormous amount of contemplating and had, an, uh, had many profound direct experiences and then something can seem self-evident to you because you've, you've inquired about it so much. But um, most people aren't there. 
Most people, when they say something is self-evident, they're just using that as an excuse not to question and investigate it. Another common trap is trying to work towards the right answer. It's like maybe you're contemplating what a thought is. But in the back of your mind, you already know what the right answer is because you've watched so many Rupert Spira videos or Muji videos or my videos or whatever else. So you read so many books that you already know. And so now you're just kind of going through the motions to derive the answer that you already know is the right answer. That's a huge mistake because there you're, you're robbing yourself of the actual discovery process. You've got to discover it for yourself. So drop all of those right answers. You might be shocked that what you think is the right answer is actually not the right answer at all if you would just go through the discovery process the way you're supposed to. Oftentimes, the right answer that you get from me or from somebody else, it's not framed in a way that it will work for your mind. You see, the right answer for me is not the right answer for you because the right answer fits in with my entire mental scheme of how I understand reality. And of course, you have a different mental scheme that you use to understand reality. So for you, the right answer, even though it will share probably some similarities to, to my understanding of a right answer to one of these questions, uh, it will still be unique to you. That's why you can't just steal answers from teachers. Another mistake is relying on external sources, videos, books, teachers, religions, and so forth. Another trap is thinking inside of your culture. You need to get really good at going outside of your culture and starting to notice how a lot of the stuff that you think is self-evident and universal and just given and couldn't be any other way, that no, really, it's just part of your culture. And that there are many other cultures that are alive today or that were alive a thousand years ago who didn't believe what you believe and what your culture believes. They had a completely different understanding of reality. And what helps with that is actually, um, this is a little bit paradoxical, is to go study other cultures. Go travel, go read books, eat different types of food, learn about different cultures. Um, so again, I'm not saying that you need to stop watching videos. I'm not saying you need to stop listening to teachers, and I'm not saying you need to stop reading books. You still got to do all that. What I'm saying is that when you're contemplating, you isolate yourself. You sort of put yourself in, in a bubble, and you set all that stuff aside. And yes, it is possible to do both. Yes, it's tricky. Of course, all the stuff you learn from all the books and videos will try to come in there and will try to disturb your, your pure isolated contemplation. Of course it will. That's, that's a challenge. But hey, you know what? You can't escape that. You can't go through life not reading books, not listening to teachers, not, not watching videos. That would be a terrible uh, strategy for going through life. So you're learning stuff all the time anyways. Even if you don't want to, it's going to be happening to you. So you can't avoid that. So just develop the skill of being able to kind of isolate yourself in the bubble and to set aside all prior notions and teachings. Uh, another big trap is trying to build grand theories of everything using this contemplative technique. Watch out for this. You might start to fall into this trap of like starting to say, oh, so now I understand what a thought is and now I understand what emotions are. Now I understand what God is. And let me now write a book using my, my journal here. Let me just start writing a book about how I think all this stuff fits together. That is not contemplation. That's theory building. And um, that's a very dangerous thing. You want to be very careful about that. As soon as you're starting to construct a lot of structure in your understanding of reality, immediately you should be very suspicious because the mind and the ego loves to construct these grand theories of everything and then get lost in them, confusing them for the territory. So watch out. That's probably the number one trap of all philosophers, especially Western philosophers. Uh, another trap with contemplation is false skepticism, rationalism, and science. And what I mean by false skepticism is that I have a, a, a video that I shot a while back called True Versus False Skepticism, where I compare and contrast how skepticism is used by the mind in a, in a partial way, which makes it false skepticism. And what that means is that you question things, but you're actually questioning the things you don't like. And you're not questioning 
your fundamental foundations, your own metaphysics. You're not questioning your own skepticism. You're not questioning your own ideology. It's skepticism used as a weapon to deconstruct religion. Let's say you're a rationalist and you love to question religion. Well, that's not going to cut it. Yes, of course, there's many, a lot of bullshit within religion. That's obvious. What's less obvious is the bullshit within your own rationalism. Start questioning that. Start being skeptical of how you're using skepticism to cherry pick and to actually build uh, your own rationalist narrative. That's what you really got to be skeptical about. And uh, the trap with science is, is that, of course, um, science is good. There's a lot of benefit we get from science. But science fills us with theories and ideas which we just accept unquestioningly. So be very careful about not bringing scientific rationalizations and justifications into your contemplating. Be careful about not bringing evolutionary theory and quantum mechanics and neuroscience and psychological studies you might have heard elsewhere. Be very careful about that. Those will skew your results. And the last trap of contemplation is a very simple one, distraction. I have a whole episode called Distraction, the Ego's Favorite Defense Mechanism. And man, uh, it's, a, it's a very pertinent topic for this, for this technique. Because when you sit down with just a, a blank piece of paper with one of these challenging questions, your mind is going to want to turn to something else. You're going to want to grab the phone. You're going to want to... Uh, grab a book and read or watch a movie or talk to a friend, do some texting, look online, do all this sort of stuff. All of that is distraction. I want you to be hyper aware of how you distract yourself from actually completing a full 30 minutes or 60 minutes of solid contemplating and try to fight that distraction. When you contemplate properly, it should make you feel scared and uneasy. You should feel all alone, like no other human being in the world can help you with these questions. That's right, that's good, that's exactly what you want. It'll feel uneasy at first, but then you'll get your footing, and then actually you'll kind of build a certain reliance and a certain independence and autonomy, which is exactly what you want. You want to develop intellectual autonomy so that you are the CEO of your life in all the different ways, both in terms of your health and your relationships and your career, but intellectually as well, you gotta be the CEO, which means you're thinking this stuff through. When you're doing contemplation properly, it should feel like you're cutting through a lot of bullshit. And at first that might feel uncomfortable and bad, but actually, Soon you'll develop a taste for it and you'll actually feel good. It's a really good quality to develop your, uh, in yourself as a human being is to be someone who cuts through bullshit. Not just other people's bullshit, but especially your own bullshit. Where you can just kind of like reflect and you say, yeah, all this theorizing I'm doing is just bullshit. And you just cut it out. This process will help you with that. So what I recommend is you start contemplating today and do so for the whole week, maybe even for the whole month, start to get comfortable with this process. The biggest problem that I find with contemplation is that the mind is just lazy and it doesn't want to do it. And it makes up excuses by saying things like, well, yeah, the contemplation sounds nice, but really there's no difference between me contemplating and me watching a video. Let me just watch a video. So much easier to watch a video than to sit for an hour contemplating. And then you'll watch videos after video, after video, after video, and never contemplate anything in your life. And that would be a big trap. So here's my homework assignment for you. I want you to get a journal, pad, pad and a pencil or pen, and contemplate the following question for the next week. What is meaning? Where does meaning come from? What creates meaning? That's it. That's simple. But there's a lot to it there. You can contemplate that one for a whole week for sure and get a lot of juice out of it, a lot of profound 
insights. So that's your homework assignment. All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please remember to click that like button and also come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You'll find exclusive content there that you can't find anywhere else. My blog, where I'm posting lots of interesting videos and other kinds of profound insights. Go check that out. The uh, Life Purpose course, the book list, and uh, the forum. Uh, By the way, I just want to say a quick thing about the Life Purpose course. I hope you understand that my Life Purpose course is like 95% exclusive, unique content that I have never spoken about anywhere else in all the other actualized videos. I think a lot of people don't understand this. They think that the Life Purpose course is just me regurgitating the same stuff that I talk about in the, in the regular videos. No, that's not the case at all. The Life Purpose course, first of all, it's extremely practical. It's much more practical than my normal videos because here we have a lot of time to really dig into exercises. There's a lot of exercises and techniques and it's all geared towards helping you find your life purpose, which is a very practical thing. And many of the concepts that I talk about there, I haven't ever talked about ever anywhere else. So that's done deliberately so that there's a point in taking the course. So I don't repeat that material on purpose. Uh, And last thing I'll tell you is that start to think of personal development and spirituality like athletics. In athletics, without training, you get zero results. And that's basically how personal development works. Imagine how good of an athlete you would be if all you did is you sat around and you just watched videos or read books about golf or tennis or skiing. You would suck, right? It doesn't work at all. It doesn't work at all. And after a certain point of watching these videos about skiing or golf or tennis, you would just get, you'd get so inundated with all this theory that it would actually do you a great disservice. Because you could talk a big talk, but you couldn't walk the walk. So it's extremely important that you start to do the practices that I have talked about ad nauseum, really, throughout my entire history of episodes. I've given you so many techniques whether it's various meditation techniques, self-inquiry techniques, uh, shamanic breathing, psychedelics, various ways to contemplate, uh, and, and many, many others. You know, I've given you so many techniques, visualizations, affirmations, reading books, and this and that. I mean, there's, there's so, much, so much to do. Start doing that. Only by doing all of that do you really then set yourself up to gain value from these videos? If all you do is you watch the videos, you will just turn actualize.org into another religion, into another ideology, and you will trick yourself into thinking that you're growing when in fact you're not. And that's a very big trap. Very, very big trap. Huge trap. I fall into that trap myself. I always have to be vigilant. You always have to be vigilant. The ego is always turning the practices into idle theory because that's what's comfortable and safe for the ego. The ego doesn't want you doing all these practices. It's uncomfortable. It uh, forces you out of homeostasis. It requires you to face uncomfortable truths and change your lifestyle and change your relationships and like... When you really start to do this work, your life will start to change so quickly and so radically that it will be uncomfortable for you. You'll, you're going to have to start to pace yourself. It's going to be too much. Um, that, that's a good place to be at. Um, those of you who just sit around watching and leaving comments and not actually doing the work, you're going to get very lost. And these things that I say are going to sound to seem, uh, they're going to start to seem crazy to you. The reason they seem crazy is because you're not growing with me. You're not doing the practices. And you're not going to be able to get to the most profound things that I want to teach you. To get to those, you got to do the practices. That's where the real profound stuff is. And that's what drives me to release all this content. So really, all this content is really just like dessert for those people who are doing their practices. And it will deepen your practices. It'll give you ideas and insights. It'll make you more excited about doing your practices. And for those of you who are new, 
you got to watch some amount of theory to to just start to get like your bearings straight about what you should do in life. So don't feel guilty about watching, you know, 20 or 50 videos to get you started cuz if you're completely new to this, you're I mean, you're just starting nowhere. Like you have no clue about what you should be doing and why you should be doing it. So yes, you do need some theory, but then as soon as you do start to kind of get a sense of or what your bearings are, then start to do the practices.